Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodburn Accountants and Advisors webinar series on choosing a location in China. Are you familiar with the new foreign investment law in China? Do you know how it might impact you as a foreign investor? Are you updated on China's negative list? Have you chosen a location in China for registering your company? Are you aware of the various zones and benefits that exist? Are you familiar with the pros and cons of being in a commercial space? Are you aware of the legal and tax consequences of choosing the right location? If you wanna move cities, do you know how it works? In this webinar series of choosing a location in China, myself and Caroline Della Sega from Knight Frank have been trying to answer all of these questions to give you an overview of the importance of choosing a location in China. In today's webinar session, we are going to be looking at a very specific case study in terms of one particular city in China, which is Shanghai. And Caroline will be offering her points of view, and I've already seen the presentation, I've definitely seen some statistics that have surprised me um, about Shanghai and the real estate market there. So I hope you will be enjoying today's presentation. Um, just a couple of administration slides. Uh, as is very typical with online systems, we may have some technical issues. For those of you that are in what I call sensitive jurisdictions, like the Middle East and China, you may be required to use a VPN to connect to the GoToWebinar system. So if you get kicked out at any point, try to open up your VPN, re-log in, um, and don't forget sound quality and sound system is usually better through the landlines, but it is not a must. You have the option of choosing your computer audio or choosing a landline. If you decide to switch, um, what will happen is you go to your audio section in the control panel, you switch from mic and speakers to telephone, you will get a dial-in number. Please be aware that there are no numbers for Asia yet through GoToWebinar. It's only for mainland Europe, US, Canada, and Australia. Um, you will then have the access code and the audio pin, and you will then be logged back. As is typical with our webinar series, we really do enjoy answering questions. You know, keep in mind, this is a complimentary session for you. Please do take the opportunity, ask questions, ask, place comments, um, and we would be happy to either answer them through the Q&A or get back to you individually once the webinar is completed. Please note, copies of the presentation as well as a recording of this session will be up on Woodburn's YouTube channel and I will be sending out an email to all registrants and attendees with that information. Now, if we could just, if I could just test you, um, if you are listening to me, would you be so kind as clicking on the hand button, which is in your control panel, that will allow me to know that you're just listening in. Fabulous, thank you so much. If you re-click that hand button, the hand will then disappear um, from, from the control system. So as I normally do, and because these are recordings that are going up on our YouTube channel, I'm kind of required to do a brief intro on who we are. Some of you have heard this um, quite a few times, but let me just redo that once again. Uh, Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is specialized in inbound investment into China and Hong Kong specifically. What we do is we establish, manage, and administer companies in both these jurisdictions based on our clients' goal within the various markets. Um, in terms of very specific services, we do everything from trade flow advisory, invoicing advisory for those companies that are just uh, transacting with China, uh, and then we move on to those, those uh, companies that are looking actually to do investment in China, and we do pre-investment advisory, market entry advisory, and also cross-border investment, tax optimization, corporate restructuring, and the very typical mundane corporate compliance and administration functions that have to occur within the types of entities you set up in those jurisdictions. Our clients are all international companies looking to expand into the Asian market, um, specifically into China and Hong Kong, but as well as other Asian jurisdictions. Um, and they are doing everything, as you can imagine, whether that might be manufacturing in China themselves, manufacturing through third parties, exporting from China, exporting to China, selling a variety of services within the market, or a multiple of those functions. 
Um, and just a brief disclaimer, um, this presentation is a general view for everyone today. So again, if you would like to have a specific consultation with Caroline at a later stage, her details will be on this presentation and you can reach her directly. Just to put a, a face to the voice, my name is Christina kohler Coluccia. There's a mistake on this slide. I will only be the moderator for today's session. Um, I've been in the corporate services sector since 2003 in China, and um, I've been helping companies with their market entry, their expansion, their liquidation, their acquisitions within the Chinese territory. So I've done a little bit of everything uh, within the last uh, 16 years. So I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm going to let Caroline, let me just unmute her, begin with her presentation today. Caroline? Hi, hi Christina and hi everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm Caroline Della Sega. I'm from Knight Frank. Um, I am a director in the Occupy Advisory team. Um, so I work across the commercial sectors um, in consultancy and transactions. I, well, well, I've been in Asia. I first came to Shanghai in 2011, um, and I've, I've worked advising institutional investors and developers and occupiers on their real estate strategy. Um, I, I've returned to the UK um, to work across Europe in capital markets and cross-border transactions, and also I worked in Singapore, and then I came back to, to China, to Shanghai, about one year ago. Um, my my experience really cover, covers the, the full gamut of, of real estate um, from valuation, um, development consultancy, um, capital markets transactions, portfolio strategy, um, market entry, um, also market entry analysis um, and leasing. Um, and we have um, lots of occupier clients um, ranging from the big MNCs to, to quite small small clients as well. Um, so a little bit about Knight Frank, um, just to, to let you know that we are the, well, the largest independent global real estate services firm in the world. Um, we have around 19,000 people um, across all the major markets um, in, in all the states, in Africa, in Europe, and Asia. Um, we've been in Greater China for over 40 years, and we have offices in Shanghai and Beijing, Guangzhou, um, in Hong Kong and Taipei, and uh, Macau, and we have also recently opened an office in Shenzhen as well. So from China, we cover all aspects of the, the commercial real estate life cycle, um, from site selection to disposal and the leasing and evaluation, as well as the project management of um, fit out and construction and capital markets transactions. And we work across all sectors, uh, the office, industrial, resi, retail, education, even car parking, um, and anything really. Um, we also, from China, do our residential international project marketing and sales for developments in the in UK and Europe. Um, so that is that is us and our firm. So um, we are going to talk today, as Christina said, about um, Shanghai um, in particular, and in particular the office market in Shanghai. Um, obviously, the week's um, topic has been about selecting your location in China, and um, Shanghai is, uh, well, my home city um, and um, a very interesting city to live in. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the current market dynamics, um, how the city has evolved, um, and also covering the, the occupier trends and the opportunities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what are those demand drivers in sort of the, the financial and tech sectors. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about the lease structures um, um, overview, so you can understand a little bit more about the, how the market works if you're looking to grow your, your business from Shanghai. And then we'll have some time for questions, so please let us know if you have any questions. So I just wanted to, to set the scene for, for Shanghai, really. So what, what what's Shanghai all about, like in terms of its brand? Um, I think it's well. It's a commercial city. It's creative. It's quite cool. It's pretty cosmopolitan. It's it's had um, been built up as a trading city with various international concessions. Um, it's a very lively, dynamic place in which to work and, and, and to live. Um, there's over 50,000 foreign companies um, here. Uh, so it's over 693 headquarters office, offices, as well as over 400 R&D centers. Um, it's also ranked the top city in China for, for doing business in, according to the, the Forbes rankings. Um, it's focused particularly on, on finance and, and technology. Um, it's the number five global financial market. Um, so the trading volume in 2018 um, 
overtook overtook Tokyo, so it just follows New York, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Um, but it's also very strong in creative industries such as media and fashion, and has a very strong entrepreneurial base. Um, Shanghai is the third most populous city, there's 25.6 million people, so just behind Tokyo and Delhi, and that is expanding ever more with increasing urbanization. Um, and for, well, funneling all those, those people around, we have the, the world's longest metro system, over 705 kilometers, um, but it's planned to be 1,100 kilometers, um, and the next longest in the, in the world is Beijing, only 637, London 400. So there's 10 million people that transit across Shanghai every day. And it's also the world's busiest port. Um, so GDP growth um, has, well, in 2018 was 6.6%. The, the growth targets for this year have been revised downwards to 6, 6.5%. Um, and I think that's a sign that the, the economy is um, stabilizing. Um, and in 2018, there, there was quite a series of, of policies, uh, such as deleveraging um, China's quarterly GDP. Uh, showed a decline in, in the year-on-year -year growth rate. Um, maybe it's because the private enterprises and small, medium-sized enterprises have, have been facing difficulties with loans, so that's um, had a bit of an impact on the market in general. Um, but it's also opened up new opportunities for foreign investors. Um, China in general is a key focus for U.S. private equity funds, um, looking to take advantage of that, um, and that's um, quite a driver in particular in, in Shanghai um, market, given given the financial capital status. So I also just wanted to, to set Shanghai in a bit of a context um, in global markets. I'm sure we have people dialing in from, from various places across the globe. Um, but really, that looking at some of the office market fundamentals and looking at the, sort of the grade A office um, across, um, the, the current picture of the higher vacancy and the lower rentals is um, really driven by the supply side. There's been a huge amount of construction in a relatively short period of development, and I mean, over the development of the city, um, 30 years or something in total, um, and there's quite a bit of um, future supply planned, and that's going to um, have a bit of an impact on, on the market, and, and we'll sort of talk through that. Um, but really, it does just, just show Shanghai is quite competitive for MNCs if you're looking at your global occupational costs, really, um, compared to other, other worldwide cities. So just to touch a little bit on, on the drivers, um, what, what, what's sort of driving the sectors um, or the, the office market. Um, Really, it's the, the, the opening up of the financial markets um, and the, the, the push towards um, tech, really, that are, that are driving um, the city forward. Um, obviously, China is entering its next phase of growth now in, in general. Um, all that rapid development over the past 30 years, um, the economy is now becoming more stable, more mature. Um, so really, it's, it's this sort of um, it's a transition period, um, and, and that's sort of across across China as a whole. Um, Shanghai's focus really is on the core areas of, of finance and trade and shipping, um, scientific um, tech innovation. Um, and these, these are sort of quite um, heavily promoted by, by the government in terms of um, industry support, uh, some of those factors we, we've spoken about over this week. Um, and that's also reflected in, in the FDI figures. I think the first half of this year, the technology industry um, which includes electronics and biomedicine and, and AI, um, saw the fastest growth of, of foreign investment over that period, which was up 230% year on year. Um, but there's also a strong um, push from the technology side. Um, there's been other um, developments on the, um, the financial sector. So there's been a new uh, NASDAQ style tech board, which has been launched in Shanghai. So um, that's going to see quite an increase in the number of, of unicorns and the new economy companies that are going to be able to list domestically rather than having to go abroad to raise capital. Um, the new board, the listing requirements are a lot more flexible um, than, than the main board. Um, so it, it allows the, those um, startups to list if they're, they're sort of pre-revenue. Um, and also the, the regulatory commission has also um, given new laws that are accelerating the pace of the IPOs, uh, speeding up its ex approvals and, and a higher pass rate. Um, there's also been, most recently, the, the new negative list, which if you join the webinar um, on Monday, you've heard Christina talking about it, um, and how um, basically um, there's more encouraged industries um, that are now, now allowed um, foreign investment in. Um, finance is one particular that they're encouraging foreign ownership in, in insurance and securities funds, wealth management, and the limits that um, on the ownership that were going to be scrapped in 2021 have now been brought, brought forward to 2020. 
um, and there's also no um, entry restriction of 30 years experience for foreign insurance companies. Um, the other the other sectors as well, um, domestic shipping, um, gas and heat pipelines, um, and also cinemas um, and, and sort of entertainment values um, venues that were um, previously had to be controlled by a, a Chinese minority is, is, is a majority, pardon me, but has now been rescinded. Um, so we're, we're seeing all these things creating a lot more opportunities to, to boost activity and, and create that welcoming environment for foreign investors. Um, I just wanted to talk you through the Shanghai market. So if we look at the map of um, the major commercial areas, um, I'm sure some of you are very familiar. You've probably been doing business here for a while and, and coming forth. But if, if you haven't, then you'll know that, um, or you'll, you'll like to know that the city is basically split into to two different areas: um, Puxi on the west side and Pudong on the east side of the Huangpu River. Um, so, really, the, when we talk about the commercial areas and we talk about the Grade A office market, um, so first we're talking about the, the, the high quality office buildings and um, those sort of um, best quality buildings um, across the city. Uh, but we, we've got the different um, CBDs or the, the central core CBDs plus all the emerging markets. Um, in the red is uh, the core CBD areas around Nanjing uh, Rest Road and Huaihai um, Middle Road and as well as Little Lujiazhe, which is the finance um, center. Um, and then expanding radially out of that are the, the, the different areas which we call, well, just the, the normal CBD areas, um, as well as some secondary business districts, and then those emerging business districts, which are in, in the gray areas. Um, if you have a look at uh, the red highlights, the, the dates, um, so we're saying over the, over the next uh, three years, there will be these um, huge amounts of supply in these emerging areas. Um, and that's also um, going to be something that we talk about in a little bit more, how it's giving new quality options for tenants. Um, especially as some of the stock in the, the CBDs um, are aging um, and, and tenants now have more op options in different different areas. Um, but, but as well as this, we also have the business park areas, which aren't marked on this map, but they're um, outside of the core city um, and rents really are, are up to about four MB per square meter. Um, mostly low-rise campus style. They're focused on IT, R&D um, and labs and also um, HQ buildings. Um, so that's really sort of like the whole of, of like the, the office stocks that are across across the city. Just to look at the uh, different districts within within Shanghai. Um, so from up those commercial areas, um, they they fall across various various districts. Um, so you'll you'll see on, on the map on the right hand side in the yellow are those um, those central business districts in the, in the downtown area um, and they all have um, slightly different industry focus focuses um, in terms of which which particular sectors they're quite keen on encouraging I mean it's obviously not exhaustive at all um, but um, just in terms of what what they sort of brand themselves as being um, particularly welcoming towards um, for say um, Jing'an and Huangpu districts um, in, in the center, really, obviously, those are uh, the more professional services firms, um, lawyers and I can't see, or the other consultants, um, advertising media, various things. Um, and then if you look, there's Shuhei, that has a slight leaning towards um, fast, well, FMCG industries and new media. Um, Hong Kong and uh, Yangpu districts, um, North along the river, there, um, well, like shipping companies, um, finance, tech startups, um, and then Minhang as well as a little bit more te tech um, and manufacturing. So that's sort of outside of the, the CBD area, um, and Pudong, which actually covers the whole of the east side, um, is well encompasses Little Lujiazhe, which is a finance district, um, but obviously a much wider area in that. So um, we're looking at the, the tech. This um, the biggest business park in, in Shanghai in that area, as well as um, logistics companies um, across all that, that location. So if you're looking at choosing your location, um, part of uh, sort of what I talked about as well um, a couple of days ago in, in the webinar is, is you know, where are your competitors? Where, where's your sort of industry focus? Um, what's your supply chain, um, customers, uh, clients, everywhere? Where are they located and where can you find the most uh, optimum solution for your location um, in Shanghai? or elsewhere.
So if we just have a look at the, the, the grade A office rents across the various business districts, um, just looking at the trends just from the last quarter, we had um, a small drop in, in the average rent across grade A offices, um, one, just over 1%. Um, but it's been dropping for four four consecutive quarters now since um, the end of 2018. So now we're at a level of around nine RMB per square meter per day across the whole. But you can see by looking at um, the, the various lines um, in in yellow, you've got the, um, the core business districts. Um, and again, this quarter, there was, a, there was a slight decrease under under 1%, but that averages around, um, um, well, the, the, the normal core of CBD rather than premium grade A is around 11.3 RMB per square meter. Um, but then there's also been some trends in, in Lujadswe, Little Lujadswe, where the rents have, have been coming down um, quite a bit. They've seen sort of over about 1.2% decrease over the last quarter to average around 12. Um, but as, as with everyone, there, there's different trends depending on different submarkets. Um, I'd say some some submarkets they've seen some increase in the average rent. It really depends on on the supply picture as well as the, the, the tenant dynamics. Um, Sujahui was one district um, which increased almost three percent over the quarter, and there was quite a lot of leasing activity in one particular building, which um, had a high high volume, high quality that sort of contributed to the overall rent increase. Um, but there's also other areas. Um, like Hong Kong um, actually increased by almost 8% on the quarter. Um, basically, there was a, a lot of high-end financial and um, fintech companies uh, who have quite high rental affordability, affordability were moving into the area, which sort of pushed up the, the rental level in that north fund zone. So again, depending on where we are, there's going to be different dynamics on, on the different um, districts and even um, very small sub-markets within those districts as well. So just to talk about the, the growth, um, the growth of the city, um, what we can see by looking here is a, a, a chart of the, the future or the, the new supply that's come coming across over over the years. Um, so if we're looking forward um, for 2020, 21, 22, actually over 75% of that new supply is in the emerging areas of the city, um, and that's going to be over. Um, well, 1.6 million square meters just in 2019. Um, but really, it's the, the, the story of how the, the city's growing and evolving in its, its overall structure, um, which, is, which is obviously affecting the dynamics of the city center and, and um, how the rentals and, and demand picture are changing across the city. Um, really, the emerging areas are, are now being supported or driven forward by um, various different factors and really one of the, the main ones is uh, the infrastructure development and the expansion of the metro uh, we, we talked about the number of um, the number of new um, metro lines um, that are coming online there's going to be another 20 in op um, in total sorry 20 in total um, expected to be in operation by 2025 um, and that only commenced really in 1995 that development um, so basically, yeah, there's still more under construction. It's opening up areas of the city um, that just weren't um, accessible before or just re really weren't an option at all. Um, and these new emerging areas are really are focused on, on that, that, that growth and where those lines go. Um, it's also a, a story of a, a flight to, to quality, uh, as, we, as we can describe it, really, where there's these international developers building grade A specifications um, in these emerging areas. Um, and it's encouraging the movement from the CBD, the, the older grade B buildings. Um, you can basically move to better quality premises in these emerging areas. Um, for cost savings as well, I mean, it could be 40, 50% of a discount in the emerging areas compared to CBD rents. Um, but really, they're, they're also not just about pure office space. Uh, there's new neighborhoods, mixed use communities, integrating the mix of uses. Um, creating new new environments, really including leisure, residential, um, and really um, building up a sort of multi multi use um, environment. Um, and also in, in the in the emerging areas in some of the, the, the um, business parks or sort of in other um, new um, new new zones um, that are sort of uh, around the city, then there's also the opportunity to have built to suit campuses. Um, the 
uh, well as RBM, picture of RBM in Zhangjiang, which is um, the, the biggest business park. Um, but really, yeah, also having the opportunity to buy on blocks. So there's been some companies that are buying whole office blocks um, for themselves to occupy. So how has the tenant profile changed? Um, if we look back to 2010, we had almost 60% of, of, of leasing demand from MNCs. But you can see now in this chart literally how the composition has, has flipped. So in blue is the MNCs, in yellow is the domestic companies. Um, so the proportions have, have changed, um, well, literally been turned on their head plus some. Um, so now, basically, the leasing demand um, is dominated by domestic companies at over 70%. Um, and European American companies are only about 20%, um, and then other other um, MNC, MNC companies or other um, nationality companies make up the rest. Um, and in terms of the sectors, the, the leasing demand um, has also included uh, mostly, most recently, I'd say finance, professional services, um, TMT, so technology, media, telecoms, biomedicine. Um, so really, that also obviously that ties into to the city's promotion um, activities and how they're targeting certain sectors and in an industry. Um, so really, the, the financial companies, um, they have taken over 30% of the total, roughly, um, from financial sector um, companies, including banks, investment and financing companies. Um, so the CBDs, the Little Lujadze, the Nanjing, Shilu areas are really uh, some of the first choices. Um, but we expect that growth rate to continue as the, the new regulations come into play as more and more foreign-owned companies as well are, are allowed in, into the, the financial services sector. So just to focus a little bit on the um, area when we're talking about the finance sector, um, Liu Jiazui is, is, the, is the location where the, the, um, the finance firms are predominantly uh, located. So that's the area across from the Bund, which gives us the iconic Shanghai skyline. Um, and again, development there only began since about 1987, um, before it was just agricultural land. Um, and now it's the, the preferred choice, the most prestigious prestigious address for financial companies, um, and rentals here are the highest in the city. Um, but it's also starting to see some pressures. So some older buildings, there's been limited new supply, um, so the cost has remained high. Um, so it's starting to, to become um, quite a weight on the market. Um, the emerging areas around uh, are capturing the attention and demand of, of those occupiers who are a bit more cost conscious, who are looking maybe for back office space, or if they prefer um, to own their own headquarters. Um, so actually, it's, it's, it's still a, um, a, a, a symptom of the, how the, the locations are graded. That the, when we look at Pudong as a whole, it includes Liu Jiazui, so the very prime um, sort of top uh, shiny towers, um, as well as like the whole of the rest of the emerging areas as well across the whole of the east side of the city. Um, so for Pudong, the average rent has decreased, so it's now just around 10, and the vacancy rate has has, has actually also decreased a little bit um, to about 12%. But over the last quarter, it was really little Lou Jadze that, as I mentioned, has become um, a little bit more more pressurized. So the average rent's gone down. Um, and there's the other area that you can see sort of across the, um, the map, there's another little cluster along the green metro line, that's the Century Avenue area. And that's really... Um, seen one of the largest declines across all the different markets. Um, basically, there was a lot of um, P2P financing companies that were, were based there, um, but since regulations on that changed, all the, those companies have moved out, they shut down. Um, there's been quite a few new completions. Um, so basically, the, the average rent there has, has decreased quite a bit, but um, it's been sort of taking up some of the, some of the demand, the overflow demand from Little Lee Jazz Bay. Um, but really, the other, the other main area, I just want to talk a little bit an example of, of the emerging areas that are sort of att attracting the attention of occupiers. Um, Chen Tan, which is further down the river, so south, south further down the river, um, it's planned to be known as the Liu Jiazui 2.0. Um, so on the next slide, thanks Christina, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's a mixed use um, areas, so there's offices, there's leisure, there's retail, there's an international school, there's residential, and it's all, all next to the, um, the Oriental Sports Center. Um, it's got three metro lines, uh, there's international developers such as Swire from Hong Kong, Tishman from the States, and they've built um, very high quality products. 
and the rentals there are approximately half of the premium grade A premises in, in Lujia today. Um, so according to the whole the, the planning for the, the Chintan area, there's approximately one and a half million square meters of office space and it's going to be completed in the next decade. Um, so really the, the types of companies that have been, been moving there, um, finance, um, technology, higher manufacturing, um, there's been some, some corporates that have actually moved from New Jersey, there's the Japanese bank, um, healthcare, um, Merck, um, Jaguar Land Rover, and then electric car maker, Neo. So they've all moved um, recently. Um, so the, the occupancy rates are, are actually um, getting getting quite good. I think from um, 2000, well, early earlier this year, it was about 27%, um, and now it's around 60%. Um, so really, it's sort of starting to, to absorb occupiers and, and build up the, the um, new areas of these cities. So um, I just want to touch on um, some of the, the typical lease terms. So if you're looking at um, moving to Shanghai, what sort of lease terms might you be expecting? Um, as well as the, the rent, obviously, which is a sort of big matter for negotiation. But um, you would normally see um, leases around three years. Um, and usually, plus your rental, you might get an incentive from the landlord where they might give you a couple of months, one to three months rent-free period depending really on the size of the transaction. Um, and that's usually to cover the period of, of fit out while you move in. Um, if you were looking um, at using an agent, then the landlords pay for that. Um, so that's usually one to two months. So there's no cost to the tenant, which is, is quite normal um, in the States as, as well as here. I know in, in the UK, it's, it's the, the tenants that pay the brokerage fees, but that's, that's, not, um, that's not necessarily the case here. Um, and also things like renewal rights, not automatic. Um, we were talking the other day about the type of uh, lease that you might want to to have if you're looking for new office space in, in China or actually also manufacturing or or, or, or what else. Um, but really, it's it's down to to you to sort of build in that flexibility if you wanted renewal rights or um, the ability to surrender the lease or to sublease um, or to to get expansion rights as well. And so that's all the things that you can you can sort of build into the lease contract. Um, on the right here, there's, there's various um, documents that we've put together, happy to share with, with any of you. We've got um, um, a global Occupy dashboard, which compares office costs across across the world, um, over 75 different markets. Um, we've also got a, a, a leasing guideline, um, which has a little bit more detail on some of the typical terms that you might expect to see, and also some typical fit-out costs. Um, and also, take advantage of, of um, research that's published um, um, basically in terms of the market movements, the office sector changes in the dynamics, um, rental investment and development um, across all the various cities across China. So if there's any more information you'd like, please let me know. Um, I just wanted to finish. I've, I've got quite a short presentation today. Um, sorry, <laughs> you can hear my voice is already going. Um, but the um, takeaways, um, I would say that yeah, we're, we're basically going into a new growth phase um, based on a more sustainable development across China as well as in Shanghai. Um, specifically, there's been such a large amount of development over the last 30 years. It's now um, are now looking at, at normalizing and, and stabilizing. Um, but really, it's those centralized policies that, that we talked about that are, going, are helping drive the economy. Um, we, we see that new opportunities are coming through for the opening up of the financial markets and access to, to other industries. Um, we see quite um, some growth in Chinese enterprises as well, so those are going to be stimulated by that easier capital raising on the new the new tech board, for instance. Um, but really, when you're looking at the market um, in Shanghai or indeed anywhere anywhere else, really, um, you, you've got to remember that the dynamics can vary quite considerably across districts. So it's all about getting to understand what the supply picture is, um, what's the demand, um, which landlords have pressure, say, from tenants moving out recently, or what are those landlords' motivations, um, so in terms of their ownership structure or the required returns um, that they need to generate, um, what are their sensitive points. Um, understanding all of that is, is, is quite important and will, will help you in securing the best, the best, possible, um, best possible deal for your new office space. Um, but really, ultimately, the, the, the current dynamics mean that, that Shanghai is a very competitive and promising place in which to do business. Um, there's various 
favorable tax policies and government incentives to locate here. Um, and I'm sure you, you heard about some of those yesterday as, as well. Um, and really, the office market is in quite a good place now um, for tenants who are looking to access quite high pro quality properties for quite good rental levels. Um, so, so yes, it's quite a good time to be in the market, and, and we expect that to be um, over the next couple of years as well going forward. So if you're looking to move, it's a, it's a good time. If you're looking to move or expand or, or whatever, um, it's, it's, it's quite a good time to be talking to, to landlords. So, so yeah, I think that just wraps up. That's probably enough from the sound of my voice, but um, we now um, can open up with Christina if she has any questions or if there's any questions that come through. Um, I'm very happy to, to answer that. Yeah, Caroline, thank you, thank you so much for, for the presentation. There was one individual who wanted to just have a clarification because you mentioned it in the beginning part of the presentation. You mentioned in some of the emerging districts that rental prices could be as low as four square meters, of uh, uh, four RMB per square meter. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, in the sort of the business park areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I'd say that sort of, um, yeah. There's some even lower, obviously, but you're getting into sort of different different quality of buildings, etc. Mm. Um, but they'll be in in um, yeah some of the more business park areas like Zhangjiang, for instance. But um, yeah, about about that kind of level. Okay, I still remember um, the days when in um, in Jinmao, um, mm. which is um, uh, where the Grand Hyatt is. Um, mm. The rental prices in those days were around 22 to 24 renminbi per square meter. It was just, it was yeah. booming back in those days. <laughs> so to see yeah, the yeah. shrinking <laughs> down is quite phenomenal over the last 10, 12, 15 years. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a uh, quite amazing it's, it's to see. Changed. It's changed. It has, yeah, it's it has really changed. Really changed. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually had a question just because this was the experience that I had. Um, I actually went through uh, a period where I did a benchmarking of a, of a five-year plan of how our company was going to grow. And I then actually, because we were in a period where rental prices were quite reasonable, I actually decided to choose a much larger size office space than was required. But knowing mm. that within that five-year period, I was going to fill that space up. And I remember signing a five-year contract, three-year term was fixed on the rental price, and there was a cap that was placed on the percentage increase for the following two years. Mm -hmm. In Shanghai specifically, what are sort of the trends that you're seeing in terms of landlords either suddenly increasing prices or, um, you know, yeah, increasing. I mean, can they from if you sign a three year contract, can they say after one year that we're going to increase because of rate market rates or what What kind of is the dynamic there? Mm, um, normally you'd, you'd fix um, you'd fix the rent sort of over a term and they wouldn't be allowed to suddenly increase it for, for no reason. Um, it basically depends on what you've negotiated in, in your contract. Um, you can have rental increase caps and say like after the term will say on, on renewal um what what will what will that um you can sort of put in some suggested renewal terms um which might have a cap or not but um i'd also say that really if you're renewing it's, it's basically a new contract so that mm. that might be suggested in, in the <laughs> existing contract but um technically you're, you're starting again it's not a sort of um unilateral agreement that that, that will go forward um right. So, so yeah, um, I'd say sort of at the moment because because the market is more of a tenant's market than a landlord's market, then there's a little bit more room for for tenants to negotiate. I think one of the things is the, the rent-free period. So maybe the headline rents are sort of some places maybe staying, but instead of what might have been one month's rent-free, now is now is three months rent-free. Um, so that has an effect on your overall effective rent. Um, what what you're actually paying over the term um, comes down. Um, and I guess we're also starting to see a little bit more like where in, in some places where the landlords might give um, even a contribution towards fit out, um, et cetera, because um, I've seen it in, in a couple of places that it's the fit out costs that actually um, 
require the, the sort of upfront capital or it's like right. an extra extra period to make it make a, a change there so i think there's there's some that yeah probably more in, in the tenant's favor than 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 it might have been in, in the past um right. but it will depend to say on sort of where you are what building what, what what's the whole picture like um in that area or that specific landlord even okay um mm. an interesting question came in about the current trade tensions what are mm. you what are you seeing in the real estate market regarding u.s companies that are based in shanghai um what what's sort of happening there yeah um i'd say that there has demand has been a little bit sort of over the last couple of years a little bit um more subdued than it than it was um i don't know if i'd say it's exactly trade tensions um it's probably just more of the general geopolitical environment um mm. it, you know not solely trade tensions but there's plenty of mm. other things we can uh, we can um, see as sort of impacting basically the decision making i think it's been a little bit more wait and see you know if it's not an a, a immediate need to do something um i think we've seen it a little bit more in the manufacturing side as as, as well um um but that's mainly for those that are quite export oriented i think if there's still enough strength and promise in the domestic demographics so if your business is quite um balanced between um serving both domestic and, and export markets then then it, it it won't have such an impact um as i say i think there's just been the, the, the general environment has maybe been um sort of slowing decision making um but we've also seen like quite expansions from u.s firms um and, and you, you know new space expansions um i think just depending on the market then it it, it hasn't it hasn't had such such a big effect right i don't see it myself either mm. um yeah uh, i don't see u.s firms exiting i i see actually u.s firms still inquiring um about how to how to enter the market um mm. a, another because question that a market that has has a growth of over six percent in terms of gdp which is although right over the other years it's it's still a lot higher than than most of the than most of the other world. countries the de- <laughs> and the demographics exactly. you can't argue with in terms of sheer number of people and and you know growth right. of the class it's right there's still a reason to be here to be doing business with, with that. but yeah um so an- another question that came in is um uh which of the which of the districts um or I let me CBD districts specifically do you think will have the most pressure next year and where where do you think most companies are moving moving to um within shanghai sorry yeah within shanghai yeah yeah um so as as I'm, um I'm just trying to think of the which some because a lot of the, the districts also cover some emerging areas so when we look at sort of on a district level um some of them like say pudong for instance that includes little luja so as well as like chantan yeah. area and the whole of the rest of 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 um of of pudong um so really the the pressures on the rentals come from from the supply because we're still in that stage where um you know it's, it's very it's very sensitive um to mm. new buildings coming up the influx on the market and then there's um, landlords that want to to lease out their space they just don't want empty space they want cash flow um so actually a, a lot of um a lot of as we as we saw a lot of the new new supply is coming up in those emerging areas um so those are attracting people um and people to move definitely and there's still certain companies that need to and want to be located in the CBD so the professional services firms um you know they're just lawyers and they're just not going to be located um out in these other areas um yeah. but really when we when we look at it on a on a district level i, I think huangpu district um is one that that's going to see quite a bit of supply coming up over the next couple of years um and it hasn't had any new supply i think for the last couple um and then there's going to be over i think over 600 650,000 um just checking um square meters coming up um just by 2021 so this this is like really central um so around the Shintendi area um if you're familiar with it um the sort of old Shiman um sort of direction so i think for professional services companies if you want to be in the CBD i think Huangpu could be quite an interesting district to to look at um because it's because of that new supply mm. um 
Caroline, we just we just got a question in that I think is quite uh, interesting pertaining to what you're just saying. So there's a question from Marcus talking about where where would you recommend that digital advertising or media companies would establish in Shanghai? Or is Shanghai not the market? Is the epicenter in Shenzhen? Oh, um, no, there's definitely room for, for digital media advertising companies in Shanghai. It's quite it's quite focused on, on the sort of the media and, and the tech. Um, and um, I've well, dealt quite recently actually with, with a, a firm from the US again. Um, Coming, coming into the market, um, I think as we as we talk about where there's um, if you're focused on on advertising and a domestic element, there's plenty of technology firms that are still based here. Um, they've got HQs of the domestic um, companies still have big HQs here. Um, it's not it's not just a one city um, sector at all. Um, so you know you obviously not just Shenzhen, you have in, in Shanghai too. Um, so yeah, um, they they they. Tend to, to vary a little bit. Um, there's some of the, the big tech firms are sort of in the Taoijing area, um, which is one of the, the sort of business park areas to the southwest of, of Shanghai. Um, but I think if you've got more of a, a sort of consulting, sort of media consulting type presence you might, um, or scope, you might want to be a little bit more central than that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a new area, the, the Xuhui, um, Xinjiang um, Riverside area, um, which is being billed as, as one of the new media um, um, sort of hubs. Um, at the moment, it's a little bit nascent. There, there's some there, but it's, yeah, so it's not quite got maybe the buzzy feel that you might you might want. So maybe in a couple of years. But um, I think if you were moving, then I think you'd be looking downtown. And I think yeah, there's various various good options. Right. I mean, I I um, get I, a lot of inquiries <laughs> from media, digital advertising type organizations. Um, and so far, their their general procedure is they start up in one of these business centers, creative business centers first. Mm -hmm. um, WeWork is probably the most popular. It's the one that most of my clients are using. Um, yeah. WeWork has, I don't even know the number of locations in Shanghai. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning every day that they're having an extra one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's generally where they're being, where they're locating, just because of the type of creativity that's there. Um, and you know, as the office builds, then they slowly move into a more traditional space. But I think the startup, that's where they're generally heading mm -hmm. to. And so far, most of them are sticking to Shanghai. Don't ask me why. I, I don't know why, but that's generally the trend is they want to be in Shanghai. I, I don't know if that's associated with finding the employees, um, but that that's that's the tendency. Marcus, mm. I hope we were able to answer your question on that. Um, final question, Caroline. A lot of what you talked about today was about um, off the office market. Um, in terms of the industrial market, what kind of trends are you seeing uh, at the moment? Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, we, we focus on the office market, but I appreciate that there might be um, people with um, a manufacturing or um, an industrial um, presence as well. So, apologies for that. I, um, I, can, I can talk about the industrial market a little bit. I'll just, um, just to say overall, um, Shanghai is very, very hot for industrial. The, the market's still um, very buoyant, there's um, good performance, there's good growth in rents and there's decreases in vacancy. Um, again, it, um, what, when, when we talk about the industrial, actually from, from the real estate perspective, we, we split into um, the warehousing logistics market um, as well as the factory type, you know, manufacturing facilities. Um, so they've, they've obviously performed slightly different, the rents for logistics. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a market that's, that's built on on um, domestic um, consumption and, and growth, um, growth there is about anything to do with um, food or home appliances or cosmetics and you know, anything like that. Um, there's there's a lot of a lot of demand for for logistics space. Um, we saw. Um, I know actually we're, we're just about to release the Q3 report, um, so I, I don't have the Q3 figures to hand. I think it's literally coming out next next week. Um, but I think over the last quarter, last so from um, Q2, um, there was there was like two percent rental growth. I think for logistics we're about 
just to give a, a number if it, if it means anything about 1.6 RMB per square meter um, and vacancy is maybe around seven um, for the factories we're saying sort of average rent again this is quite general across across Shanghai um, it's about 1.25 1.27 so I think I, I um, these rates really yep. competitive compared to the surrounding provinces and cities mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, that's yeah, that, that's true because yeah, you've got then outside of the Shanghai markets, you've then got Wuxi and Suzhou, and you know these these sort of the next the next belt, um, which are just as popular in demand because they're servicing the you know, the Shanghai market really as well as reaching out. But yeah, you, yeah, you've seen that too. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds mm. like uh, Shanghai is really trying to be competitive to still attract those type of industries to its area. Versus people then going out um, yeah. to the to the kind of suburb. I, I mean suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> suburb. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think a lot of what's happened. I mean, especially for like the old factories, right? So Shanghai doesn't really want the big old factories in the in those kind of now that are becoming like new town areas. You know, like if you think like Songjiang has a new district. Um, it's it's becoming rare. Like some of the old ones are, are being upgraded. Um, you know, they're the so the, the the amount of stock is, is kind of decreased as well, um, and the difficulty with, with logistics um, is that it's just the, the industrial land is really tightly controlled. Again, for the, the, these reasons, um, logistics compared to manufacturing is a lot less welcomed by um, by the government because it doesn't have as high tax generation um, or you know, productivity. Um, it doesn't employ as many people because you know, especially <laughs> coming into the age of um, automated warehouses and, and things like that um so so yeah it's just it's just really hard to get hold of those those good logistics properties but you know again that's that's even even the same in some of the really high demand areas i would say like just outside of shanghai as well great well i think that's the end of all the questions um caroline thank you so much for joining us today um as everyone can see on this slide, there is Caroline's email address. Please feel free to reach out to her if, if you do have any other questions pertaining to real estate contracts or, or these types of things. Um, I hope that we were able to provide you all with an overview of why it's important, first of all, to, to, to work with real estate agents who know the market so well have the relationships with the landlords and are able to guide you on location studies to find the right places for you. But how it's also important to then side by side work with corporate service providers to look at the legal and tax complexities around finding your location in China and what you need to think about. Um, it's, it's not all straightforward as, as one sometimes thinks it should be. So, you know, you do need to develop your ecosystem of providers in China that will help you on a variety of things such as real estate, um, legal issues, tax issues, et cetera, to guide you through um, the market entry as well as expansion. So again, reach out to Caroline if you've got any questions regarding real estate needs. Um, if you would like to talk to me just about your market entry needs or questions you might have about legal and tax issues or the foreign investment law as well, don't hesitate um, to reach out. Uh, if you enjoyed this webinar series, feel free to subscribe to our weekly newsletter or follow us on the various social media sites. And last but not least, we have our December, January and February webinar series that are up and running and if you are interested in these various topics you can subscribe to them on our events page on our website so you can go ahead and do that already today because they're all they're all set up caroline again thank you so much for joining us and for spending your thank time you. this week with us and to everyone else that joined all four sessions thank you very much for spending your time as well listening to us mm -hmm. i hope you found the information useful so i wish everyone a great afternoon great evening um, and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.